If you'll take your Bibles and turn to, first, uh, for, to uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read the book, but we're going to be focusing on verses 9 through 14. Colossians chapter 1. Before we do that, I, want to, I just I want to talk to you about something that uh, we, we have going on in our lives. We're getting ready to send our oldest daughter off to college. And she probably didn't expect to be part of the opening illustration just by the look on her face. But as, I was, as we were going and visiting just recently, one of the things that came to mind, one of the things that just kind of struck me is I was remembering how much that first semester of college just kind of was a big kind of eye-opening wake-up time and everything for me. I remember going and thinking, you know, I mean, when you're a senior in high school, you are on top of the world. I mean, everybody, you know, you've been in, you know, you got all these special trips and things like that going on. And, you know, you really, you know, everybody kind of looks up to you. And then you go to college and suddenly everything is different. You're the newbie. You're trying to figure out registration. Oh, man, I can remember registration. And you get there, and it's probably a lot easier now, but you know, you're going through these lines and filling out these little dots, and you're like, you, you're like, how do I make this all work? And suddenly you're thrown from a place where you're totally comfortable to a place where you're not quite so uncomfortable. You're thrown from a place where you feel like you've got it all figured out, you've got high school figured out, and then you're in college, and you go to that first class, and that teacher drops the syllabus in front of you and says, you're going to be writing these papers and this, and you're going to do it without any mistakes, because if you make more than two mistakes, you'll probably fail the class, you know, and, and, and you're just like, Ugh, I'm dead. And, you know, it's really good for us sometimes. To, I, I mean, did, that, did I change? I mean, was I a different person? Was I any less capable the day I left high school, then the day I went to college. I, I was the same person. It's that everything around me had changed. I had gotten a little different vision for what's going on in life. <laughs> I'd gotten a little bit bigger picture of reality. And probably it's the same thing when you leave college and go to your first job. But it wasn't that I had changed. It, it, it really was that I had seen something greater than what I had experienced before and realized there's a whole new level that I need to kind of move into. And when I look at this passage, especially uh, the, the part that we're going to be focusing on, it's really a prayer of Paul. And I, I've been excited just kind of studying through some of the different prayers of Paul. But as I look at this passage, I you know, it's one of those passages as I started looking at it, more and more, I'm like, wow, this is another level. And it's a good thing. I mean, it was a good thing for me to go to college. I remember coming back my, the end of my freshman year, my freshman at Christmas, the end of my first semester, thinking, I'm a different person than I was four months ago. And going into God's word and being challenged by that can often do the same thing for us. As we look at God's word and we see some things that we hadn't maybe seen before or maybe just hadn't really kind of grasped, it's a good thing for us. It pushes us on in our Christian life. And I hope as we read this, this, that'll be the effect of this passage, which is a very challenging passage in our hearts. We're going to read the first 14 verses of Colossians chapter 1. So let's, if you wouldn't mind, stand with me as we read uh, these first 14 verses of Colossians chapter 1. The Bible says here, uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from, the God, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have for all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye have before, heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, and is, it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, 
and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of, of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. And this is where we'll be focusing, verses 9 and on through 14. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us unto the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. You may be seated. Here in this passage, I wanted to read those first uh, few verses because it gives us a little bit of a background to what we're about to read. Especially since the beginning, uh, verse 9 says, for this cause, it's good to understand why he's praying this way. And as we look in those first few verses, we see that Paul is giving thanks. So really, technically, you could say the prayer begins in verse 3. And Paul is giving thanks for the Colossians. It's interesting Paul had never been to Colossae. Many of the books that you read where Paul is, 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 is talking to them are books where he has actually talked to those people. He's been there. He maybe started the church. But here in the book of, for, with Colossians, he had not been there. In my Sunday school class, we're studying in Ephesians. Paul had spent three years in, in, in Ephesus working with that church. You know, we, there's two books to the Corinthians, and Paul apparently spent somewhere maybe about a year and a half in Corinth. It was a very strategic place. But in Colossae, Paul had not even been there, and yet he's writing this letter. He's even praying for these people, and you'll see it's a pretty earnest way. And I think, I think that by itself says something. Paul was concerned more than just the tight circle around him. Paul was praying for people that he knew of who were, who were Christians who needed his prayers. And I, I, it's sort of uh, challenging me. Who, who are the people that we tend to pray for? I mean, it's good for us to pray for the people that we, we know we're close to, but do we ever think beyond that to praying for churches and, and people maybe around the world that we don't know very closely? And Paul is a great example for that for us. He also is praying because of things that he had heard, at least, about them. It seems that the church in Colossae was begun by someone he himself had worked with, a man named Epaphras. And Epaphras, you, you kind of catch him through the Bible in some different places. He was obviously a man that the Lord had used in a lot of ways. In some ways, maybe this church was Paul's, these people in Colossae were Paul's spiritual grandchildren. He hadn't been able to be there, but Epaphras had been there, who was someone that he had probably led to the Lord and had discipled, who, was then, who had then started this church. So you see Paul giving thanks to them, really. And what was the subject of his thanks? It was for their faith and for their testimony, how they had been growing. And, and, the, and he, was, it was, he was able to rejoice in the fact that God was working in their midst. But I want to focus today really on the, the other part of his prayer. So he gave thanks to them, for, for them, to God for them, but he also had some very specific requests for these Colossians. And I think it's very fair to say that these are the kind of, if he's praying for this specific church, these are certainly the kind of requests that we could be praying for for our church. These are the kind of requests that we could be praying for for other churches, other you know, churches, maybe our friends or, or loved ones around us. These are the kind of requests we should be praying for individuals within our church. Even these are the kind of requests we should be praying for God to do in our own hearts. So we're going to focus on this prayer, particularly the section where he has requests 
for the Colossians. And I think that as we look at these requests, you see Paul kind of laying out a greater vision, a bigger picture maybe than they had had before, certainly than I think we in our modern day Christianity sometimes see for, the, for this church and for our own church. The section that we're looking at is verses 9 through 14. And in verse 9, it starts out, Paul starts the part where he's talking about his request, and he says this, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Here in this first verse, it's sort of like the, the, the main request. You're going to see the next verse sort of is a sub-point of that, and then the specific requests kind of flow out. They, they all kind of point to that. But this first request is probably the most general request, and he's praying alongside of his desire, okay? This is something he both is praying for, but he earnestly wants for them, is that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will in wisdom and spiritual understanding. It's interesting, this word knowledge can kind of go two different directions in the Bible. And actually in this passage, God is using it in both ways. Paul is using it in both directions. So sometimes we get the idea of knowledge and it's not just like head knowledge, it's like something that's inside of our hearts that makes us live in a different direction. We would call that wisdom or skill in living as a Christian. Okay? And Paul actually uses it that way. He says he wants them to be filled with knowledge of his will in all wisdom. Okay? When Christians begin to know what God wants, know God's will, that can change them in their own lives. You know, we encourage people to read the Proverbs for wisdom, for God's wisdom. Okay? But really, all of God's word does that for us. His prayer is that they would know his will, which is found in God's word, in wisdom, so that that knowledge of his word would change them. But also, he says, there's two parts of that knowledge. The second one is in spiritual understanding. He wants them to have something beyond just this skill. He wants them to have it in their heads as well and in their hearts in a way that will enable them to not get things wrong. When people come in and share false doctrine, that was happening even in, in, the, uh, in the church at Colossae. There were people coming in with false doctrines that they would know God's word well enough that they could see it and reject it. They could reject the errors that were being brought in. On the other hand, that they would know it well enough that they would know the truths of God, things that could help them then on, on the other side in their walk with the Lord in wisdom. So Paul's first prayer request is that they would know God's will well enough, which is found in God's word, that they would both live it and know it so that they could know truth and expose error. But he says that, and then he goes on and says, that ye. This is something that follows that. He, it's a really a tight connector. It's not just, you know, another request. When you, when you actually look at the, it's, it's a different word for that ye there than it was in the middle of verse 9. He's, he's saying, I want you to have this knowledge of God so you might be able to, in verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He wants them to know God's will so that it changes their walk. And the phrase there that we find is a very challenging phrase. Think about what it says. It says, walk worthy of the Lord. Just a couple weeks ago, I think it was Janet, it was Janet, played an offertory of a song based on that text, walk worthy of the Lord. There's some places in the Bible where it talks about walk worthy of the kingdom, Walk worthy of the Lord's, you know, of, of the fellowship of believers. But here he's saying something very specific. He's saying, walk worthy of the Lord himself. 
Now, I, as I think about that, what, you know, what would that look like? I mean, if you're trying to walk worthy of Jesus, that's a, that's a pretty tall order, isn't it? That's his prayer for them. And it is a tall order. It's a tall order that none of us really in any way of our own strength will possibly meet up. It's only the Lord that can help us grow more and more that way. You know, when you think of the, the word worthy, I mean, the reality is none of us are worthy of the Lord. We don't come with anything of our own that makes us worthy. On one side, you get Christ who gives us his righteousness so that God can accept us. But on the other side, this is really talking about sanctification. And he's saying he wants us to walk in a way that's worthy of the Lord. This is not that we're going to be perfect, but it is that we are growing more and more that way, that we are growing more and more like the Lord. Think about this. Maybe, maybe another way to put it is that we walk in a way that points to the worthiness of our God. Do our lives point to the fact that we serve a God who is worth everything? I think of Paul. We were just reading uh, in Sunday school about Paul who was in prison at that time, and he was possibly looking at being, being I mean, he, he ended up in that time in prison. He ended up being beheaded. He was, and he was encouraging the Christians at the same time. Paul basically was saying with his life, it is worthwhile to serve the Lord, even if it costs me my life. That's a big thing. But, you know, we don't face, we, we don't normally face that, do we? Do we, as we go through our lives, do we normally, hey, you know what? I'm going to do, I'm going to serve the Lord, even if it costs me my life. That is not a choice most of us in this room have had to face. Maybe any of us. But can we take that down a notch? Okay, is it worthwhile to serve the Lord even if I have to give up maybe some of my own time? Is it worthwhile to serve the Lord even if I have to uh, lose out on this or that? Or maybe I give to the Lord and, and I, have, you know, I have less of my own for that. I, it's so it's so easy for us to get a disconnect between someone who's going to serve the Lord to the point of giving up his life, and then in our situation, someone who's going to serve the Lord and maybe be a little less comfortable, or maybe be a little bit more busy, or maybe, maybe have to give up their favorite show. And Paul is saying, he's challenging them to walk in a way that's worthy of the Lord. It also goes on and says, unto all pleasing. And, you know, that, that phrase almost seems to be stuck in there. And, and, and the question is, who is he saying that it would be pleasing? And, it's, and really, when you start thinking about it that way, there's no way it's talking about, we walk worthy of the Lord unto pleasing ourselves. It's talking about unto pleasing the Lord. And I remember sometimes, at, you know, some of the... Some of the, you know, you sit around sort of talking about different things and you, you know that we cannot please God enough to go to heaven. There's no way we can. This is not what it's talking about. It's talking about people who are already believers because of the blood of Christ that was shed for them. But who God is calling now to live a life that's pleasing to him. I, I think there's maybe some relationships in our own life where we can sort of see that connection between God who loves us and is totally committed to us and yet still can be pleased or displeased with us. As a parent, when my kid fails, when my kid blows it, when one of my children blows it, it I'm sure it happened even this week in one way or the other, there's times when as a parent you're grieved by the choices your children makes. And it doesn't mean you love them any less. In fact, Maybe sometimes your heart goes out to them because you see and you see the consequences for it, for them, and you, your heart is, is just heavy because of that. There is love in that. We don't just give up on our children because they mess up. Oh, not, you're not my child now. That's not what we're talking about here. It's not talking about God, you know, just wiping us off because we, 
we displease him. On the other hand, it's not that we're more saved because God is pleased with us, is it? But we can please God. As children, you know, parents sometimes, you know what it's like if you're a parent when your child just, just really does well and you're just excited to see them changing, growing, whatever it might be. It could be a soccer game or something like that, or it could be just you're just so thankful that the Lord has kind of taken their life and turned it back towards him. And that's really the idea with this kind of pleasing that Paul is talking about, that God as our father, God as our parent, can look down and go, yes, that's exciting, and not be it's disappointing. I'm going to have to discipline. I'm going to have to work to bring them back around. And so Paul says that he wants us to be filled with the knowledge of his will. He's praying for this church, just as we should pray for others, that they'd be filled with the knowledge of his will, that they might walk in a way that's worthy of the Lord and also pleasing to the Lord. And then he doesn't just leave that out there for us. So we, okay, so well, uh, what's that really mean? He gives us four examples in this passage, all right? Even in his prayer, he's praying for four specific things that would fulfill those things, that would show that they know, the, they have the knowledge of God's will, that would show that they're walking worthy of the Lord, that would show that they are trying to please the Lord and actually pleasing the Lord. There's four things in this passage that, that kind of describe that, what that looks like. And really, the first first ones you see in the end of uh, verse 10. The first one is, okay, so if they're going to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing or pleasing the Lord, the first thing that you'll see is that they are being fruitful in every good work. They're bearing fruit in every good work. There's, there's different descriptions of, of fruit in the Bible. Some of them are the fruit of the Spirit, and that certainly is something that I is a huge challenge to us in the first place. This seems to be geared a little bit more towards what is going on in our life. Is your life a life of fruitfulness? Was their life a life of fruitfulness? Can you see how the Lord has used you to make a difference in, your, in, in the church around you, in your family, in, in the community? Paul was praying for these Colossians that they would be those kind of people. He doesn't want the church at Colossae to just be a nice little church in those four walls that is just stuck there and they kind of get along pretty well. Every now and then they got some problems, but they exist. And last year they had a certain number of people and this year they had a certain number of people and they're just happy with that. He wanted them to be growing. He wanted them to be fruitful, that their lives would actually touch the lives of others. So he said, being fruitful in every good work. Those, those are things that touch other people's lives, but they're, they're things that just point to the fact that they're serving the Lord. He wanted them to be serving and fruitful in their service. And then he says, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So while he's already prayed for them to, incre to, to, to have knowledge, he also, to be filled with the knowledge, he wants them to be increasing in the knowledge. The kind of Christian that he is praying for to, 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 in, in Colossae is the kind of Christian that he, he's praying that they will increase in the knowledge of God, not ever be satisfied, okay? At, at the beginning, he's talking about they'd be filled with this, but can we ever know enough about God? Can we ever know God well enough? Do you have a hunger to keep on growing and learning about him more? Do I have that kind of hunger? And the truth is, often we get satisfied we're kind of, we're happy. We're in, in our senior class and we're kind of happy where we are and we don't realize that there is so much more that God wants for us and has for us in his word. So he wants us to be fruitful in good works. He wants us to increase in the knowledge of God. And then thirdly, he wants us to be strengthened with all might. Now, when I think about strength, you know, I mean, probably the first thing that pops in your mind is some bodybuilder. Okay, I would probably not be on that picture. But we think of a certain kind of strength when we think about strength. We, we might think about the person who, you know, as a Christian, man, they are, they are on fire and they are ready to knock down the walls of hell. Uh, battle, 
however that might go. All right? They're the kind of people that just kind of walk around with a really strong step. Okay? And some of those things I think that we think about when we talk about strength, that at least what he's talking about here is not exactly, it's not like, you know, this something you can just sort of see this extra vim and vigor in them. There's, he actually describes what the strength might be. He says, strength and with all might according to his glorious power. Okay, it's not our own strength. It's Christ's strength that's in us. And it, it, I would have never thought to, put, to describe it this way, but I think it is a great way to describe it. I think it's something that might help us understand some things. Unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Would you think patience and long-suffering is the first maybe description of strength, of spiritual strength? Would that be the first thing we'd think about? I, at least when I read it, I wasn't thinking, okay, he's going to, you know, when he talks about strength and describes it, that's what he's going to describe it as. How did those two tie together? How does strength proved in patience and long-suffering. Think about Paul when he had that thorn in the flesh, okay, some kind of physical suffering. And then he ends up saying, my strength is made perfect in weakness. That might give us a little connection. The reality is we need, he's talking about spiritual strength. We need that strength from the Lord in James, the Bible talks about how in trials, God strengthens us, gives us patience. We tend to have one view of strength, but really Paul and God is telling us that the strength he's talking about is the kind of strength that allows us to go through great trials and still remain strong with the Lord, still depend on him, still have our faith on him and trusting him and loving him and being thankful to him. In fact, it says, it uses the words both uh, patience, okay, so in, it's the idea of endurance, that we endure those things. We don't give up. We stay, you know, looking to the Lord and running to Him. But on the other hand, it says long-suffering, that, that, that there are things in our lives that we suffer through and we keep on being willing to be in that place and suffer through those because we, we're looking to the Lord. And then it just kills us. This passage can just kill us because it says not just patience. We think of patience or endurance kind of like, oh, I'm going to grit it out. <clears throat> I'm going to make it. And long suffering, oh, I'm just suffering. And he's saying with joy. I mean, that's a pretty big standard, isn't it? It's pretty high. So he says we go through trials. Strength, this strength he's praying for them is that they'll be strengthened so that they can go through trials and still remain in joy. What is it that can give you joy in the midst of trials? It's only when we're running to God and depending on him and just trusting him to help us through those things. And so Paul is really describing this spiritual strength is that, that he... That, that, that these people that he's praying for will be able to go through those trials and be strengthened by God and be able to remain having joy in those trials and temptations and all the things that they face. And they certainly did. The, book, the, 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 Colossians was a, the Colossian church was persecuted. And that you'd be able to do that and remain in joy. Think about what a testimony that is to people around you when you are under trials, maybe it's persecution, or you are under physical trials, and God gives you the strength to face those things in a way that no one can understand. And that's what Paul is praying for them. He's praying that they'll be fruitful. You'll see fruit for their label. Labor, you'll see an increasing uh, knowledge of God that they both have a hunger and they are continually wanting to learn about God. He's praying that they'll be straight, so strong spiritually that as they face trials, they will go through them as overcomers with joy. And he connects this to the last thing that he's asking for them, and that is that they'll give thanks. You know, 
I don't think that these last two things are entirely separate. In fact, it seems like they bridge from one to the other, that they'll have strength, which means patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. And then he says, giving thanks unto the Father. The last thing of those four things is that they are a thankful people. He's praying that they will be a thankful people. One of the things, one of the marks of maybe that person who has that kind of spiritual strength is that in the midst of trials, we know and recognize things that we can be thankful for. I, I don't know about you, but I'm not always in that place. I'm very often not in that place. Where I get in the midst of a trial and the first thing I'm tempted to do is thank the Lord. That's not always my testimony. That's maybe not often my testimony. And Paul here is saying he's praying that the Colossians would be able to give thanks to the Father even in the midst of those trials. They'd have joy and be able to give thanks. And then he tells them what he, he, he describes what they would give thanks for. It, one of the problems when we get in those trials, we get down under things is we forget, we lose sight of what we have to give thanks for, isn't it? Somebody says, give thanks, and you're like, what do I give thanks for? And so Paul, he is praying for them with the things that he would, he, he would commend to them to give thanks for. And, and just look at those. Look, look at those with me. Th giving thanks to the Father. Here's some things that you can give thanks for. Here's some things that he was praying that they would remember to give thanks for. Which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Okay, so the first thing here is that they would be able to give thanks that God has made them meet or able or sufficient to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in light. You know, when we think about that, when we think about what we're partakers in, in the saints of light, we tend to want to think of heaven, right? And that is something to be thankful for. But I think he's saying he wants us to give thanks that we're partakers in all the parts of the saints in the flight. Paul uses that same word partakers in other places, talking about partaking in trials. And he's saying, I'm thankful that God has let me to suffer some of these things for your sake as a partaker in Christ's sufferings. So, you know, we get, when we get that inheritance in the saints of light, should we shrink from the trials when we get all the blessings? Or should we be able to thank God for all those things together? He says in verse 13, another thing, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us translated us into the kingdom of his son. You sort of get both sides of this picture. Where were we before we had the gospel? Where were we before we had Christ? We were in the kingdom of darkness. We were dead in sin. And he uses this word delivered. When he saved us, he took us and rescued us from the grips of sin. We could not on our own self possibly please God. We could not stop our own sin in our own self. And yet he rescued us from that. He took us from the power of darkness. We do not, and uh, Romans 6 talks about how we are no longer under the power of sin. We still sin, but we have the ability in Christ to break from, break from that, to change. And the other side of it, he says, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Translated, that's, that's, uh, that's an Interesting word. We, we just studied the tra translation. But think about what is translation? You take it from this realm, maybe the Greek language, and you take it and put it in another realm. The English Bible we have here. And he says something like that has happened where he has translated us from the kingdom of basically darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. We're in a totally different place. How glorious is it that no longer do we have to be under the dominion of Satan, but now we are under Christ's rule. So he's praying this for them, that they will be sufficient, or that we'll get, he's praying that they'll give thanks because God has made us sufficient to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints, and also that he has taken us from being under the power of darkness to into the kingdom of Christ. And then lastly, he says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, 
even the forgiveness of sins. Do you notice that pretty much everything he's telling them, okay, so, so people who are under great trials, the things that he's saying to give thanks for all tie into the gospel. They all tie into the fact that we have something great and precious that's far beyond anything that we might be losing in the trials that we face. If there's anything we can grab a hold of in the times of deep, deepest trial, it is the fact that we have a Christ who loved us, who died for us, who paid the price for our sins, who redeemed us, and we have something to look forward to in that inheritance in the future. So Paul prays these four things. Now let me ask you this. Are these the kind of things that just naturally occur in churches around the world? Would you say this describes most of the churches in your experience or most of the people in your experience that they have this kind of a, a desire and walk with the Lord, that they are walk worthy unto the Lord, that they're fruitful in every good work, they're, they're very fruitful, they increase, they, they love to read the word, that they, when they're, they're so, that they're strengthened so that when they experience trials, they do it with joyfulness and that they're always giving thanks. Is that the experience that you see regularly in the lives of others or in your own life? I, I can't say that that, you know, if you read this, I, I don't think that Charles Pritt is the name that I think of when I see this. I don't think this describes me as much as I'd love for it to. And so that is the point of this prayer, that we need to be praying for each other with this great vision that we will be more and more like this and that the others around us will have, have this kind of a heart. Think of what it would be like if this church was filled with people with this kind of a vision, this kind of a love for the Lord that they are able to be described with this passage. Think of what a difference it would make in our world. I mean, the truth is, probably our, despite all the blessings that we have in our Christian church in America, we often probably don't light much of a candle next to churches that are experiencing much greater trials, that have much less than we do. We are those seniors in, in, our, in our high school who are kind of pretty happy with where we are and we need God to work in our lives like, he, like Paul is praying for the Colossians. And so as we close this message, I, I, I think there's really several things for us. The first is very clear. God calls us to pray with, with Paul, really, for the real spiritual needs that we have in our lives. Not spiritual needs, even on the negative, but spiritual needs that we would be these kinds of Christians, that others around us would be these kinds of Christians, that we would have a burden to pray for others like Paul prayed for, for these Colossians. So I think first point of application is how, how does that, you know, can, can this help your prayer life? You know, uh, I, it's, it's funny. I was thinking about it how so often sometimes I'll be praying and I kind of run out of things to pray for. That doesn't happen all the time. But there's times when I, you know, I feel like I've prayed, okay, uh, you know, I, I, well, okay. And the reality is I'm not often praying for these kinds of things. There's... Limitless possibilities. That's why Paul can say, I never cease to do this. I never cease to pray for you this way. So the first application is, will you ask the Lord and will you seek to pray more for others in this spiritual way? I think a second application is, if this is what God wants for us, Paul is praying for the Colossians and he's praying for them both as his prayer and as his desire for them. Clearly, this is what God wants for them. Are there some things in this passage that you say, yes, God really wants me to grow in this area. I need to be praying more, even for myself in this area, as well as, as I pray for others. Is there something in this passage that God may have said, this is something I know you need to grow in? And you'll take it to heart and say, God, please do this work in my life. Let's bow in prayer.